Hey everyone, it's Kyle here, and in today's video we're going to be investigating the relationship between motor power and rotation speed. So today we're going to be looking at the relationship between the input power of a motor and the resulting rotation speed. And I'm very excited to share this video with you today because we're going to be experimentally determining this relationship. We're going to be measuring some data based off of a few different EV3 motors and we're going to plot our own graph so we can visually see what the relationship looks like. Now before I begin, I know it's kind of easy to just assume that the relationship between these two variables is linear. Like we like to think that if 0% of the power gives you 0% of the rotation and 100% of the power gives you the fastest rotation speed, that everything in the middle is going to be perfectly linear. And we're going to find out today that that's not necessarily completely the case. If you're giving your motor 50% of the power, it doesn't necessarily give you 50% of the rotation speed. How much does it actually give you? Well, we're about to find out right now. So let's get to our little experiment. I first want to explain to you my methods, how I conducted my experiment so that you can try something similar with your own robot. First, I created a simple program in Robot C that would allow me to graph the relationship between motor power and motor speed. How my program worked is it would first set the motor's input power to 5% and it would hold it there for one second. During this one second, the program would use a high technic angle sensor to measure the rotation speed of the motor in RPM or revolutions per minute. And it would do this five times where it would take five measurements over one second and then after that one second had finished it would take the average of these five measurements. And then once it was done it would bump up the motor's power another five percent and then repeat this process over and over again until the motor got to max speed and then the program would stop it. The reason why I took an average of five values at each five percent power increment was to smoothen out some of the fluctuations in motor power because if you just took one RPM reading at any given point in time it might be a little bit lower or a little bit higher than expected but taking an average over one second allows you to get a more reliable estimate of where the true rotation speed was at that time. I ran this program using three different motors an EV3 large motor, an EV3 medium motor, and an NXT motor to see what the power properties are like for each of the three motors. The reason why I chose to use Robot C to make my program is because it has this neat debug stream. I had my program print the result RPM to the debug stream along with the corresponding power value. This allowed me to keep track of the rotation speed at each given power level and helped me with data analysis later. After I finished collecting and recording all of my data for the three motors, I put the data into a spreadsheet so I could do some analysis. The spreadsheet allowed me to make a graph of my results, which I'm showing here. This is my completed graph of rotation speed versus power level, which shows the relationship between these two variables. The blue line represents the EB3 large motor, the orange line represents the NXT motor, and the red line represents the medium motor. Now the medium motor of course had the highest maximum speed of 236 RPM. The NXT motor had a maximum speed of 156 RPM and the EV3 large motor had a very similar maximum of 158 RPM. As you can see the blue and the orange lines overlap so much that they're practically identical. And this supports LEGO's claim that the NXT and the EV3 large motors are mechanically identical because it so happens that their speed was exactly the same at each power level. The medium motor of course was a little bit faster but the most important thing to take away other than the speed is the overall shape of the curves. You could see that from 0 to about 90 percent the curves are very straight and linear and they increase with a constant slope. At the end after about 90 percent power they start to level off and you get these diminishing returns where an increase in power doesn't quite give you the same increase in rotation speed. Let's interpret our data. What do these graphs actually mean in the real world? Now as you saw the relationship between power and output speed is mostly linear but towards the end the graph starts to level off. You get this diminishing return at about 10 percent where the rotation speed doesn't quite keep pace with the input power and that's probably due to, to friction and just the general diminishing returns. Now what I find most surprising is how linear the rest of the curve is. From 0 to 90 percent all three of the motors had a very straight curve that had a consistent slope throughout. 
typically with a motor, we model the relationship between uh, input power and rotation speed with something called affinity laws. And they generally have to say that the output speed of a motor is related to the square, of, the inverse square rather, of the input power. So you get a lot more diminishing returns than you would see with a normal EV3 motor. Is that you'd see the greatest increase in the beginning and as you go on it starts to level off a little bit more. Now with the EV3 motor, like I said, it's very linear. So what I think is that something within the EV3 brick has a special motor controller that linearizes the power. So if you tell the motor to run at 50% power, the EV3 brick actually proportions the power that goes to the motor such that you actually do get closer to 50% of the rotation speed. And this is one of the things that the EV3's motor control does automatically without us programmers thinking about it to make programming a little bit easier so we get more consistent results. Otherwise you would use 50% power and you'd be getting closer to 75% of the rotation speed and anything past that would give you diminishing returns. Thanks for checking out my video this week. If you found it helpful, be sure to subscribe to my channel for more tutorials like this every week. And if you have an idea for a tutorial, leave it in the comments section below. Thank you, and I'll see you next time.